In this first webinar of the series, we will hear from several experts about the work being done to take into consideration the new operating environment and flight rules for unmanned aircraft systems or drones. Technological advances and their applications are changing the operating environment and in many cases is resulting in an increased reliance on automation, both on the ground and airborne. With this evolution in technology, perceiving traffic and a remote pilot's ability to see other traffic or obstacles in order to avoid collision will take place on a new definition as compared to traditional aviation. As a result, the role of the human in the loop will evolve into supervising the airspace and managing all phenomenal situations. This webinar today will provide an opportunity for our speakers to discuss future levels of automation and the requirements for future flight rule concepts to ensure safety, scalability, and accessibility in any airspace. To start our webinar today, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Ms. Ruby Syed from IATA. Good morning, Ruby. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Don, and thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this webinar series and the first one uh, organized leading up to Drone Enable. I am delighted to be here with the, with the audience and also with our uh, speakers who are joining us to discuss all the important elements and, um, and areas that you mentioned in the introduction, uh, especially when we look at what the future operating environment will be with the scale and diversity of different operators, not only from the new entrance perspective, and some of them are not new anymore, they are here, they are operating, but also the evolution of traditional aviation and how traditional aviation is also exploring um, technologies and digital applications. So with that, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome our speakers who are joining us for this discussion, starting with Nancy Graham, who really needs no introduction. Over the past few years, Nancy has been working with many of the new players in the airspace and a lot of the traditional players as well. Uh, most of you know her also as the, uh, previously in her role as the director of the Air Navigation Bureau at ICAO. Next, I would like to welcome Leslie Carey, who is the chief of the remotely piloted aircraft systems section in the Air Navigation Bureau at ICAO. Leslie is known to many players in the arena of RPAS, UTM, UAS, Drone Enable, and all, all of that. Next, I would like to introduce um, Todd Donovan, joining us from Talos, where he leads the airspace mobility solutions business for the Americas. And uh, he is focusing on the incorporation of new entrants into the airspace. We also have Peter Sachs, the program manager in the Federal Ad Aviation Administration, the FAA. His main focus and also passion is making UTM a reality. Welcome, Peter, and thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we have with us Bala Ganesh, who is the Vice President Engineering at UPS, where he oversees several engineering and technological projects. And just to um, introduce the discussion and start the interaction between, between our, our speakers, I would like just uh, to address a first question to everyone. With all the elements that we see in terms of automation, varying levels of automation and aircraft performance that we will have in the airspace in the next 10, 15, 20 years, how is that going to impact the role of the human in the loop? And what does that mean in terms of interaction between pilot and ATC and the new partnerships between uh, humans and systems. And with that, let me start with, um, with Nancy and uh, your perspectives and thoughts on that, and then we'll go to the other panelists. Thank you, Ruby. Good morning, everyone. That's a big topic, I have to say. I think this is a, a challenge that is very much live and ongoing. But I think we do have to crack this. And I really do think that we're well on our way. So first I wanna congratulate ICAO for doing Drone Enable. This is a good venue where positive lessons learned and, and others are exchanged through uh, really sharing information about what's happening uh, with the new entrants and how they're adapting and how the traditional systems are adapting to their entrants. So I think that's really important. 
But in terms of the, the man-machine interface or the human-machine teaming, I like to call it, I think we have finally gotten to the place where we know and have accepted emotionally that we have to, we just have to accept the automation. And the human has a higher level role of the exceptions. How the information is presented to the human to make decisions, I think it's more the questions now of how, not whether. I think we've definitely crossed the bridge of whether. And I think in this discussion, we'll get into some more examples of that. But there've been really good examples so far uh, and, and opportunities to learn. Thank you for that, Nancy. And uh, definitely a very good point about the how, not the weather. Uh, so from a, from a user perspective and, you know, uh, UPS is, uh, is, a, is a combination of traditional aviation operation plus expanding uh, operation using unmanned aircraft. So Bala, how do you think the future is going to be in terms of the human in the loop, the interface between humans and, and systems and automation? Thank you. Um, first of all, I would say that there is a, a business need for um, this new mode of, of uh, transportation and, and uh, cargo movements because um, there are segments of population that today are not served appropriately because of uh, lack of density or even the distances that people are, are there, lack of infrastructure, etc. So um, I definitely think that's going to improve uh, how we serve our customers going forward. Having said that, um, the, uh, I would say the fundamental role of both uh, the pilot and uh, the, is going to be the same. The question is going to be, um, first of all, of course, they're not on the uh, airplane, they're remote. And then the question is going to be, what is the appropriate um, level of, of automation uh, with appropriate oversight by the by the human at the, at the right time. So, um, so the question I think is what you know how much information to give. You can give all of the information, but when is the right time to give the information and how to present it? As Nancy said, uh, which is going to make sure that the person is available, he or she is available at the right time to intervene uh, as required. So um, I definitely see the role continue, but the question is going to be. Uh, Number two, of course, number one is remote, and number two is um, giving the right information at the right time to make sure that people can intervene at the right time. Thank you very much, uh, Bala, for uh, for these uh, good insights. And uh, yes, the level of intervention and the when is going to be a determining factor uh, when we try to reimagine the future, the future airspace and the infrastructure surrounding it. So Todd, from, from your perspective and, and you're involved in several projects uh, that you are uh, overseeing in, in the US, how do you see the role of the human evolving um, and adapting to this new, uh, let's say digital environment? Thanks for being good morning, everyone. Um, we think it's a fundamental paradigm shift and, and um, and it, we're at the beginning of it. And, and so I, I think it's sort of helpful to look at aviation in the broader scale of history, right? The first few decades of aviation, we were focused on how to build aircraft that can fly and how to pilot and navigate and do things like that. And then after World War II, we started getting into, um, you know, bringing air traffic control in and bringing surveillance in so the air traffic controllers could see what was happening. And eventually we brought put TCAS on the aircraft. So then the pilots start to have some situational awareness to avoid collision. And all that was about scaling the industry. How do we increase capacity? How do we facilitate operators like UPS uh, to be able to fly and to, to go where they wanna go at the, at the scale that they want to go? And I, you know, I think what we're seeing today is the beginning of the shift from a pilot to pilot interact or a human to human interaction, pilot to air traffic controller, both assisted by technology to a longer term trend towards machine to machine interaction supervised by humans. Um, and, and it's a fundamental shift. And I think, you know, we're at the very beginning of it today. And so with unmanned systems, we're sort of trying to force them into the existing manned aviation framework, but over some period of time, and it may be five years, it may be 20 years, it may be 50 years, this transition is gonna happen. And I think what we're trying to do is to lay the foundation of the, the policies, the, uh, technologies, the um, regulations that allow this this industry to evolve, 
um, and the scaling of the industry to take place. And, and that's really kind of what we're at the beginning of right now. Thank you for that, uh, Todd. Uh, very good uh, points. And that's a good also uh, intro to, uh, to Peter and your perspective from the FAA, but also you have um, personally, you worked with Airbus UTM and now you're back with the FAA. So how do you see this future of evolution building also what, on what, uh, what Todd was saying? Thanks, Ruby. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's really important to think about this from the perspective um, of the air traffic controllers. That's how, that was my point of entry to aviation. So it's how I think about a lot of these things. And controllers today have a really big toolbox at their disposal. There's some automation, also just lots of different techniques that they can use, not just for mundane situations, not just for emergencies, but for all the weird things that happen that you don't wanna have unravel into an urgent situation. Um, so I'll give an example. My first facility was Chicago Executive. It's a small general aviation airport just north of O'Hare. And it had this fairly complex um, IFR procedure to get out from under and away from O'Hare's arrivals. It was from the southbound runway, a right turn 220 degrees around to fly northeast. Um, and I remember working this one time with a King Air that departed and it turned a little bit wide and I had to make a traffic call with a 777 that was landing at O'Hare. And then I watched my next arrival coming down the localizer. And this was supposed to work just fine with the opposite direction rules. You had to get the departure through the localizer pointed the other way before the arrival got to the outer marker. And I'm watching this pair of targets converging and it's not quite working. So I reach into my toolbox and what do I do? An extra turn 60 degrees farther right for that departure, stop their climb so they go under one of the uh, arrivals at O'Hare. And I'm sweating bullets at this point, call up the departure controller and, and let them know what I did. None of this was in the LOAs. I wasn't sure if I'd had a loss of separation or not. And a few minutes later, the departure controller calls me back and goes, hey, nice work with that guy. That worked out really well. And the reason that worked was that we all had ways to communicate and control the situation. And what worries me about the future is not the end state where we have these very advanced autonomous capabilities, but it's this actual intermediate period that we're beginning now where the automation can only handle some situations and even slightly unusual situations require human intervention. What we need to be focusing on is creating a new toolbox for controllers so that they're not overwhelmed trying to gain situational awareness but also so that their hands aren't tied because they can only communicate with one aircraft or because the flight plans are so complex that they aren't really comprehensible to human eyes. Means, um, but we do need to think concretely about the roles humans are gonna play and design from that perspective rather than keeping things onto the human as a tool of last resort. So that's, that's sort of my call to action today. Um, I know there's a very diverse group, not only on the panel, but watching. So for the regulators and ANSPs in the room, what are your expectations and requirements for what these systems will do in this intermediate period? For industry especially and academia, please share your findings, your research, your best practices. This doesn't have to be a peer-reviewed journal. This can be something more informal. Um, we can't afford to silo our knowledge. We really need to be learning from each other right now. Thank you for that, uh, Peter, and very good points. Uh, you mentioned the toolbox and uh, Leslie, um, you were also a controller uh, at, at one point throughout your career and now uh, been working at IKO in different, uh, in different aspects. So how do you see not only the evolution of the role of the human, but the evolution also of uh, the enablers to give uh, the human in the loop, the toolbox that Peter was, was mentioning? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, thank you, Ruby. And yes, I can build a little bit on what Peter was saying, as well as the others in that, yes, I started out as an air traffic controller. I worked at Anchorage Center in Alaska, which when I started was more non-radar than radar for the entire FIR, the Flight Information Region, with mountains and ocean and extreme weather. So going from the point where we were having to figure things out on paper in our, in, in our heads, because we had no automation tools, or at least very few. But during my career there, it, the automation was replaced. It was updated on a regular basis. 
by the time I left, it was a totally different environment. And the controller's responsibilities and their support tools onto the toolbox that we already had to work with, but now the support tools were so dramatically different, it was a different environment. And that was more than 20 years ago that I left. So just to date myself a little. The world now at Anchored Center, I can't even begin to imagine what it's like now for the controllers. 20 years into the future, when we have all of these new things going on, all of these new types of aircraft in the airspace, at very low level, at very high level, different levels of automation and autonomy. And where do the controllers come into play? Where do the pilots, the traditional conventional pilots, what is their role with all of their increased automation? And then what is the role of the remote pilot and the automation systems, particularly the automation systems of aircraft that do not have a single remote pilot per aircraft. All of these roles are going to be dramatically different from what they are right now. How do we get to that point? Well, that's going to be primarily a technology and a human factors issue. The human factors will have to drive technology as much as the technology will drive the human factors. And then how do we regulate that? How are we going to be able to adjust the existing aviation regulatory framework to accommodate this entire change that was not envisioned when, particularly at ICAO, our regulatory framework, the Convention on International Civil Aviation was drafted. We're dealing with a 75-year-old document and trying to put this new world into it. It doesn't always fit. So how do we collectively, all of the countries around the world, the civil aviation authorities of 193 states agree that we have to make some changes because the world is a different place. Respecting the past, respecting all of the principles that are embedded in the convention, but recognizing where the world is going. So that's going to be a tremendous challenge for all of us. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Leslie, and uh, very, very good points uh, mentioned there. Uh, before we carry on with the conversation, and I have some follow-up questions for the panelists, if anyone from the audience would like to ask a question, then please use the Q&A. Um, uh, function. There's a tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll take your questions as they as they come through. So, uh, proceeding with our conversation, and a lot of good points were mentioned. Leslie, you mentioned the um, uh, the uh, the evolution of the toolbox, the evolution of automation, and Todd. We've had various conversations about uh, information versus vision, and how is that going to play into the future. And while we have some steps um, before we reach the end state, as Peter mentioned, if you look at many of the concepts of operations coming up, the, uh, the projections are, are, are actually uh, implying that there will be huge amounts of traffic at all levels. Urban air mobility and advanced air mobility aircraft will not all operate below 400 feet. They will operate above. Um, with the varying levels of automation, as Leslie mentioned, uh, Maybe the one pilot per aircraft will not be the model for the future. So when we have these networks of different types of aircraft, different performance and capabilities, how is that going to impact the future of traffic management? And then bringing back the conversation to the title of the webinar, how that could impact the way we, um, uh, how could that impact flight rules specifically? Um, so your thoughts on that. It's a great question. And, you know, I think some of the, the points raised by the panelists are really important. I mean, Peter highlighted the fact that 
the importance of the controller and the controller's role. And, and that's, that's going to be critically important to this transition um, because we can't imagine that existing aviation doesn't exist anymore or that we're just, it's going to go away. Even when we talk about low altitude operations, you still have helicopters and other things that are operating there as well. So we're very quickly going to exit the ability to have sort of a segregated area where we can have unmanned operations and nothing disturbs it and go to a world where it's gonna to have to be more dynamic. And it's gonna be more dynamic in the sense that you may have an urban area where uh, you have a lot of UAS operations that you want to have taking place. Um, and occasionally you have some helicopter traffic. And so you need to be able to say, how do we make that work? How, what's the role of the controller? Uh, what are the systems that can facilitate enabling the scaling? Because if, if somebody like UPS wants to deliver packages in an area, they're not doing one flight, they're probably doing thousands or tens of thousands of flights in order to, um, you know, in order to make it economically efficient and make it work for them and for their customers. And so, you know, I think what we're going to be, um, you know, I think we're going to benefit from the technology evolution that's happening, right? I mean, more and more things are connected. We have more information, we have more bandwidth, we have the ability to, uh, to exchange data in ways that we couldn't do even 10 years ago. And in some cases, we still can't do with aircraft. Um, and, and that's going to create the opportunity to uh, rethink how this works. But I, there's going to be a, a huge system integration challenge and a huge human factors challenge as we start to look at how do we uh, put manned and unmanned systems together um, in the same airspace or uh, you know, maybe tempor temporally separated in the airspace, so operating at different times, but being able to transition and use the benefits of, of what is the traditional ATC capabilities, uh, what the controller does, the tools that they have, as well as some of the newer ones that are coming. And so I think the discussion about airspace classifications, about flight rules, about how we manage those things um, is fundamentally at the core of that, because I think the idea of publishing airspace once a month and, um, you know, and, and having a little bit of dyna dynamics with uh, um, TFRs and other things of that is not going to enable the scaling that we need. And so we're going to need to start looking at some of the fundamental underlying assumptions and approaches that we've used in the past and start to progressively change those. Uh, in order to facilitate the, the scale that we want to get to. Thank you for that, uh, Todd, and very good points. And um, uh, you mentioned automation and Leslie mentioned uh, automation and autonomy. And um, Nancy, you've been working with uh, different players in the airspace. And uh, I think Peter also mentioned supervised systems. So in your view, supervised systems and uh, some of the definitions you're working on, like attended uh, autonomy, how does that fit into the picture and all, or doesn't fit into the picture? And what do we need to start thinking about or some of the questions we need to start answering to enable that future state? Thank you. I, I, good points everybody made ahead. I guess one of the things I've learned because it's a constant education, I have to say it with the new interns, is the, the language that we use in aviation today is not suitable for what we're trying to do for tomorrow. So for example, we use the word certification with a big C. It has a very specific meaning. Um, we need to change that language. It's probably more like validate in the future. Controller and pilot have very different meanings for the future. So I think when, one of the things that is helpful is to begin to create a different language. And the language enables a discussion about what do you mean by that? So for example, I'm gonna take uh, high altitude airspace for the moment. It's a low density environment where you have autonomous, primarily attended autonomous systems, fleets. So this isn't where you have a remote pilot with a single aircraft. You have a fleet of things. Some look like airplanes, some look like other things, some look like airships, some look like balloons, but they're crafts. And the, this discussion is craft agnostic. So one of the things that we've been doing is beginning to create a new language for that. So high altitude, platform systems is what these things we believe are gonna be called because they're a system of systems as, as are um, our past and others. But in this case, it's multitudes that comprise fleets. And we're starting to use the term attended autonomous fleet system, distinct. So th that means any system that includes a fleet of objects agnostic to the craft, right? That have some degree of autonomy in the execution component 
and the task lead to the completion of a particular mission, whether that be to deliver communication or telecommunication services or whatever the mission happens to be. And that is serviced by a fleet and systems supervisory network, which is kind of a mix of controller and pilot. So you've got piloting aspects to that fleet and you have control aspects to that fleet in terms of self-separation from its own fleet and others. And supervising that network then as a fleet operations director. So you begin to talk about what is the right mix of human machine teaming that allows at altitude, and I'm talking about not through transition of controlled airspace, but actually at altitude, what is the right mix of automation that enables an off nominal correction, but enables the, uh, the computer to do the primary work. For example, in Loon's case, Loon is a fleet of balloons, um, they, they have several, many different systems, 2000 pieces of information come off that balloon a minute, and that is all done by automation in terms of its navigation, taking on board that information. It's constantly looking at self checks of, of the battery capability of the software on board, the hardware on board, software on ground, right? A whole series of things that make its decision about how it continues to navigate to its point where it plans to be. That all happens through automation. What the, the, the relationship between the air navigation service provider and the oversight by the Civil Aviation Authority then becomes an understanding of what the system is in terms of its safety capability, its target levels of safety, and how they are assuring that those target levels of safety are sustained. Building a UTM for that upper airspace that has commonality with UTM at lower airspace is fundamental. The DNA between them is the same. So those concepts are the same. It's a question of very short hops on the slower and but very long durations of a year or so on some of these craft. So I would advocate that the upper airspace is a place where you have low density and the most automation with the most forward leaning craft that are the most weird. And that's gonna give you the laboratory for beginning that dialogue and beginning to understand the relationship between and, and give us a chance to, to continue to learn. That will inform the, the standards that need to be built for that communication. And that will inform eventually the policies and regulation that needs to be adapted. And I don't think, uh, I think we come to ICAO when there's a community of understanding uh, and that can be documented in early days. So Leslie's right, ICAO is a very difficult organization to change, but there are mechanisms and the RPAS world and Drone Enable has used them like circulars that document what we know so far and provide best practices to both civil aviation authorities and ANSPs. And they can be updated very frequently to take on board the lessons that are learned. So I think there's a pathway of progressive steps. We just have to be judicious about which ones we use and, and that some can be applied to, to other airspace. I think in the passenger traffic, it's a different question over time, but in the unmanned space, there's a series of progressive steps that I think are gonna take us there. So I'm personally, I'm very confident.